So the next speaker will be Dr. Daniel Clausen. Dr. Clausen is a neurologist and MSA Coalition board member who cares for patients with MSA as part of an interdisciplinary team at Vanderbilt. He works closely with his colleagues in autonomic medicine to determine effective neuroimaging approaches, biomarkers, and clinical findings. He has a personal connection to MSA where one of his family members suffers from the disease, so he knows the realities of this affliction. As a clinical researcher, he is also well equipped to discuss what is involved in clinical research for MSA patients and family members. He's going to discuss for us how to get involved with research. Thank you, Daniel. Please welcome Dr. Daniel Clausen. Well, it's good to be here. Uh, it's good to see familiar faces and meet new people. So I'm going to um, not be too scientific. I know you guys have just been bombarded with very interesting scientific principles. And I'm going to be very practical. And I'm going to give you a 12-minute rundown of what happens in a clinical trial and try and get you excited to get involved in clinical trials and get your friends to be involved in clinical trials and get with your centers where you're getting taken care of to get your physicians involved in clinical trials. All right, so I have two boys. Their ages are 11 and 8. And this morning at about 6 o'clock, my 8-year-old really thought that there was some kind of complex spy thing going on in the Magic Kingdom. I don't know where he got it from, but that's what he thought. And he's convinced that there are secrets in the Magic Kingdom that there are, that he wants to find. So he found a website and started reading about it. So it turns out there's some interesting things. So we're going to talk about clinical trial secrets because we're at the Magic Kingdom. All right? All right, so I take care of a lot of patients and we do a lot of clinical trials. I think the important thing to remember about clinical trials is that we need them if we're going to find better ways to prevent, to slow progression, to diagnose or treat disease. In this case, we need clinical trials in MSA. We need lots of different types of clinical trials in MSA. It's a rare disease. There's a lot of variability to it. There are a lot of different things that can cause progression to accelerate in certain people, so we need them. The critical point that I meet with my patients with is I say that clinical trials are not therapies. They're not effective treatments. And I think that's one of the big things that generally people wrestle with. If I don't get in a clinical trial, that means I'm not getting a life-saving treatment. Or if I get in a clinical trial, it means I might be cured of my disease. They're, they're not always like that. We need to do these to, to find out the answers before we can actually get effective treatments. Clinical trials happen in places where there's clinical medicine. So usually, in the case of MSA, which is a rare disease, they usually happen in big medical centers. So we're, we're hosted by Dr. McFarland. He's got a big MSA center in the, in the University of Florida. He gets involved in a lot of clinical trials. And if you like, wanted to go check out the University of Florida, you weren't there and you live nearby, you may want to go there to find out about clinical trials. Um, at where I practice at Vanderbilt, we take care of a lot of patients in the middle Tennessee and surrounding regions. We have a lot of people coming and into our clinic and interested in clinical trials. Generally speaking, you find a big major academic center, you find clinical trials. However, you can also find clinical trials in clinics that aren't linked to academic centers. A lot of clinics now, like um, some clinics here in, in, in Orlando even, have opportunities to get involved in clinical trials. They don't have to be involved in a big, large ac academic medical center. And even there are some clinical research sites in the United States that have clinical trials. So they can happen in a lot of places. The key part a lot of people ask me about is how do I find out where a clinical trial is? And I think generally speaking, your best bet is to look at this website called clinicaltrials.gov. Now this is a website that kind of maintains all the current recruiting and even the past finished clinical trials. In the case of MSA, you can go to this website, and you can type in multiple systems atrophy and press enter, and you'll get a huge list of clinical trials that are going on in the United States, around the world, to get an understanding of what people are doing and what's recruiting, what may be interesting for you, what may be not so interesting for you. 
You can also talk to us at the MSA Coalition. We try and keep up uh, an active list of trials. We try and help companies advertise their trials so that patients who are newly diagnosed or asking about MSA can get connections. It's also important to talk to your physician. Your physician should be able to also navigate sites like clinicaltrials.gov for you and tell you, oh yeah, I know that person in Minnesota, or I know that person in Tennessee or Florida, and I can, I can call them for you and, and find out what's going on. So it's really a dialogue and kind of updating your, your information to find out where trials are. So here's an example this morning. I, I typed in multiple systems atrophy, and I print, press enter in clinical trials.gov and I said I want, I want you just to show me uh, trials that are recruiting so here's one I circled it for you so it's a study of BHV3241 that rolls off your tongue nicely in patients with MSA we've already heard a little bit about this this study um, from uh, Gregor but essentially you'll see here that it's, con it's a condition is MSA the intervention is a drug and then a placebo and then the locations, you can actually see which sites are doing, are doing this study and you actually can kind of go through and see if that site's close to you or there's a way you can get to it. And so uh, this, uh, this is an example of one that's currently recruiting and you can um, get on the site and find out if it's, it's good for you. So what are the types of clinical trials? And I think this is important as you think about getting involved in clinical trials, right? So there's observational trials, which are really important for us to get a sense as to how the disease is progressing, what are the clinical symptoms people are struggling with, what's important to patients, what's, what's important to your health that you think uh, needs to be addressed clinically. Um, generally speaking, these observational trials don't require any therapeutic intervention. That is, you don't get a drug or a placebo, you don't get a treatment, you just uh, are followed clinically. There are phase one trials, and these generally are first in human studies. So this is where you have a compound, perhaps you have done some toxicity studies in mice and primates, and you feel pretty comfortable that there's no uh, issues that would be given in humans, but you really need to find out. And so you would do a very structured and careful study where you give a dose of that therapy to an individual, and you make sure there's no uh, clinical problems or safety issues that arise from giving that medication. A lot of times um, what happens when you do those phase one studies is that you might give that therapy to a patient and follow them for a long time and to see if there's actually a uh, clinical effect. And so in phase two studies, which generally occur right after phase one, sometimes they're kind of blended together. We call them phase one B, two A all these numbers, but essentially the idea is, is what I'm doing, giving you, is it hitting the target? Is it causing a possible clinical effect? And if so, then I may go to a larger study to ask the question, is this clinically relevant? Does this therapy actually do what I think it's gonna do? And then, and then sometimes you can have what's called open label, where once you finish, say, a phase three study, you're guaranteed to get to clinical study. So you may, for say, for 20 weeks, get placebo or treatment. You don't know what it is, but at, at 21 weeks, you're definitely gonna get the treatment. So that's kind of the overview of the kind of trials that you might uh, come, come across when you look at MSA. So my biggest advice to you, if you're wanting to do clinical trials, is know what you wanna get into. Know, know what's gonna happen, and this is, information that's completely uh, open to you. You don't have to search for it. It's, it shouldn't be hard to understand. It should be very explicit to you. And we use what's called an informed consent to go through the entire trial with you. So this, these questions that could come up. So, you know, how long is this gonna take? What do I have to do? What exactly is this thing that you're giving me? How are you giving it to me? What are the procedures that's gonna happen? What is the risk? All these kind of questions happen in the informed consent. So as a, as a patient and as a caregiver, this is a really critical part of clinical trials that really puts you, the power to you. You are the decider of whether or not you wanna do or not wanna participate in this study. And it's important to go through the informed consent and make sure you understand it because if you don't understand it, then it's not a very good informed consent and the, the communication's not going very well. So inclusion criteria are referred to when the, the patient, what characteristics define the patients that are for that study. Not every study is for everybody. Some studies, or may, you may be a good 
person for, some studies you may not be a good person for. But we generally talk about inclusion criteria to define what's the study that really fits you as the individual? What characteristics do we want to look for in this study? And sometimes we also have what's called exclusion criteria. And so this can sometimes be a downer. This is my family on one of the log rides, and you can see my wife is a little bit petrified in the middle. But sometimes, you know, there may be things that happen in your life or medical history that make you not an ideal candidate for the study. And that's, that's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that you're, you know, you failed or anything like that. It's just part of the study because you want to make sure that uh, the risks are appropriate, that there's no uh, issues with involved in this study and so we talk about exclusion criteria to make sure there's nothing that you have or there's nothing that's happened to you to make sure you may not be the right fit for the study. So what we try and do in clinics is we try and do what's called pre-screening. So you know what's better than one bar? Two bars, right? So we'll, we'll look at your uh, information very carefully before, gosh you guys are slow, it's like getting laughed five seconds later. So we'll, 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 get, we'll look at your uh, clinical information maybe before you even come in the screening, just to make sure there's no surprises. You know, For instance, if one of the studies requires you to have an MRI scan, then having like metal in your, in your eyes or your, or your neck may not be a good thing for an MRI scan. So we may look at that in your chart to make sure that you, know, you don't have to go through the whole screening and, and, and all those procedures to make sure you're not a a eligible. So, who are the people you're going to meet during a clinical trial? Your number one person that you're going to meet is going to be a clinical trial coordinator. Now this might be a research nurse, this may, may be someone who, who is like a, a research, what they call a research associate, but this person is going to be your main go-to person. At, at our clinic, they, you have their cell phone number, and so you'll text them when anything happens or you'll if you have any questions you can call them this is your main kind of conduit to that center that medical center where you're getting that uh, treatment you'll have a clinician involved that clinician will probably do a clinical exams or talk you uh, talk with you about the th treatments they may even deliver the treatment sometimes we do treatments where we do lumbar punctures uh, and you'll have ancillary staff that you'll meet so these are the kind of things that might happen in a in a trial so you may get an MRI scan of the brain this causes some consternation with patients because if you look at that bore, it's kind of uh, small and people get a little claustrophobic. But you know, that's a MRI scan is really one of the ways we can non-invasively look at what's inside the skull and see what's going on. So sometimes if that's a concern to you, you can do things like a mock scanner. So our institution will like have a pretend MRI scan. You can get, get into it, get used to it, make sure it's not scary, things like that. But that, that's a really important um, uh, procedure that happens. Sometimes you do what's called lumbar punctures. That sounds really scary, but this is a picture of my friend Ed Wild, who does a lot of work for Huntington's disease, and he's done now four lumbar punctures himself of his own lumbar puncture to show people that it's not as bad as, you th as it sounds. In that, in that procedure, you may kind of sit on the side of a bed, you may get some numbing medicine in your back, they put a needle in your back, kind of like an epidural if, you, if, you're, uh, if you were pregnant and had an epidural, those kind of things, and they take fluid out. Sometimes you have what we call cognitive testing, and that's a word that makes you think, oh gosh, I'm going to fail or pass. But here's what we're looking at is how, how fast you think, how well you think. In this example here, someone's got a list of words, and they had to kind of list as many words as they could, and they could write it down. And that's something that may happen in this. So you have a lot of different procedures. Some are invasive, like a lumbar puncture. Some are... Um, sometimes difficult to deal with, like an MRI scan, and some are pretty, uh, you know, straightforward and just conversation. You take notes, kind of like a neuropsych uh, test. So, what do you get from participating in a clinical trial? I think big, the big thing is you help others. I think so many patients with MSA are so selfless, and they really want to help others. They want to help the next generation. They want to help people with MSA. And I think clinical trials is a great way that you can really invest your life in the lives of others and in the future of science. I think it's really fun to be involved. We find that our patients love to meet with us. We often meet with them like every, every four weeks. We get to know them really well. They get to know us very well. We share stories about, about outside of work. It's really good to be involved. It's fun to test treatments. It's fun to be involved in the clinical science uh, 
uh, progress to see if these th treatments are actually helping or, or not. And I think the biggest part that we try and emphasize to our patients is that you want, we want a, you to be part of our team. We work with you. Uh, we want you to tell us what's important to understand, what's important uh, to, to do, how things are working. And I think that's really the best part, in my opinion, of being in a clinical trial is that you get to be part of the team. So what do you want to do now? Get involved. Talk to your clinicians about being involved in clinical trials. If they're not involved in clinical trials, ask them why not. And then if they say, well, they're not interested, then say, well, tell me who is, because I want to be a part of it. Tell your friends to get involved. You'd be amazed how many people we get through clinical trials who, for, through word of mouth, or through Facebook, or through social, other social media entities. Empower your clinical team. We've had so much success in having patients and caregivers help our team become better at what we do. And stay in touch. Stay in touch with the MSA Coalition. Ask us questions. We're here to help you get involved in trials. So thank you, and these are my boys, and they're right now at Epcot, but um, I look forward to talking to you more. Thanks.